Hello and welcome to The Rest is Football. I'm Gary Lineker and joining me as usual, the dynamic duo of Messrs. That's Messrs, not Messi, <laughs> sadly. Uh, Messrs, Shearer and Richards. It's Sunday evening and we're recording this immediately after the Carabao Cup final. In fact, so much so that Mr Shearer is in the back of his car uh, on the way to the airport, where I presume he's flying home uh, to Newcastle. Um, Alan, um, you were doing Five Live co-commentary? I was, yeah. It was great to be there. It was a fabulous atmosphere. How on earth it ended nil-nil after 90 minutes because both sides had great chances. I mean, the story for Liverpool, the keeper was brilliant, Van Dijk was superb. The courage and the belief that Jürgen has to put the the youngsters on against <laughs> World Cup winners and say, go on lads, this is your time, this is your stage in one of the biggest and best stadiums in the world in a cup final, go and show me what you've got. And they were absolutely magnificent and, and for for Big Verge to score the goal after the disappointment of one of them that was disallowed then um, yeah I was I was pleased for Liverpool really pleased for them yeah absolutely I mean uh, t- talk about confidence boost for a young oh. player to have the, uh, have a manager of Klopp's oh. um, stature and status to put you on at that at that point it's incredible Micah really and you thought to yourself crikey Chelsea yeah. surely now Surely this is going to be your moment. But actually, um, Chelsea had had a patch in the game, hadn't they, where they were on top. But at that point, from there on in, the kids kind of, they were more dominant, I think, than Chelsea were. I mean, both it, teams had chances. It was chances, great. But... Do we, can we call that bursting onto the scene now? Can I let that, <laughs> can I let that tag go yeah. and give it to the, the new breed? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, honestly, it was so, it was so great to see because... Yes, we know Liverpool had injuries, but to trust, you know, all you want from your manager when you're a player is just that trust. And he trusts them. He made the decisions to put them on. And it's not like, you know, sometimes when you're a, young, a youngster, you go on the pitch and you're just basically running around. But it was how measured and controlled their performance is. Well, I just thought watching that, it was, it was really great to see. And it was just the yes. chemistry between the, the fans and the and the players and the manager, Klopp has built something extraordinary there. And it's going to be sad to see him leave at the end of the season because imagine trying to come in after Klopp. It's going to be so difficult. It will be very difficult. Um, a, a friend of mine, Chelsea fan, was, was texted me at the final um, after the presentations and stuff. And he, he said how... Klopp has this real, like almost family type atmosphere in his squad. And he said, by contrast, we, him talking about Chelsea, was saying, you know, Todd Bowley was there and all the players and, and, and the Pochettino and all the players. It was like there was no connection whatsoever. I mean, it, it's obviously always worse if you've lost the game. So that makes a big difference. So don't want to read too much into that. But... Um, but there's no question that, that Klopp has formed uh, an incredible family type atmosphere, not just between him and the players, but between the players himself and the fans as well, um, which is easier to do when you're successful. But he's the, he's the person, he's the catalyst that has made Liverpool Football Club what they are again uh, today after many years in the doldrums before he joined. Yeah, he's got a, he's got that special relationship you can tell with every single one of his players and you you get the feeling that they just run through a brick wall for him. Um, the, the way he treats them, the way they've got respect for him, the way he believes in them. I mean, the, the injuries that live, if, if there was ever a chance that Chelsea were going to win the, uh, the, the the cup, it should have been today with the injuries that Liverpool had, but such is the belief that Klopp's got in his, uh, in his team. Mm. It's, it's just as well that Liverpool got a winner and, uh, and it was Virgil van Dijk because the, obviously the, the, the disallowed goal was another one of those where the VAR does its absolute level best to try and find something that's wrong with it. I mean, it was obviously given for offside, even though Endo wasn't uh, interfering. And actually, if you look at it, I felt on this particular decision, I understand why they did it, because they said that, well... Otherwise, Colwell would have been back in that area and maybe would have defended it. But if you look at Colwell during that, he's absolutely satisfied to stay where he is because Endo, in his, in his, he's got him marked. So therefore, he doesn't feel the need to drop in there. It was, I mean, I just think that's a kind of... Yes, they can look at it 
you know, math kind of forensically um, through a through a spyglass and try and find something. But I think they look too hard there. And I don't, what they don't have is a feel, a natural feel for the game and understanding because Colwell wasn't going to go back there because he didn't need to, because he was marking Endo, who was making no move to get into that position. It was, um, what did you make of it, Alan, actually being at the ground? I, I couldn't understand it either. I mean, Chilwell's marking Van Dyke. Not, not Colwell's not marking mm. him, you know, and he might have got mm. there. He might, he, he may not have got there. But once the on-field decision was given, you know, I think you need something massive to overchange that, mm. um, especially when it's so yeah. subjective. From a Liverpool point of view, luckily they've won it because I think that was such a huge decision and a wrong call. And you can imagine the reaction from Klopp at the end of the game if I hadn't have gone for them. I just, I just didn't like the decision at all. Micah. I, I just think we need to look at VAR again, don't we? Really, I think we all That's put, what we do. We all put, in in we terms do. of, and yeah. you've said it, Gaz, and you've said it, Alan. It was supposed to be for the absolute howlers, and that wasn't a howler. So, but the problem is, if that goal would have been given straight away, and because of social media, people break down the game, the knowledge of the game. The look at certain situations, they were going to say, oh, Colwell was, was blocked there. Why have VAR not looked at it? So because now everything is scrutinized, now we're going through like nitpicking at stuff that doesn't need to be looked at. It should be just for the howlers and it would save them. It would take a lot of press, pressure off the referees as well. Yeah, I mean, even looking at that forensically, I mean, you can say that that was a block, but basically he just stood yeah. still. He didn't charge at Colwell. He didn't make a move into one movement or the other. He didn't, he just was, he was in a position where he knew he was offside. We see that all the time. Players then come deep and then he just moved deep and, and Colwell's going, well, that's my man. I've got no reason to, to, to move from there. So I, I think, yeah, I think it was, a, it was a mistake and it was a mistake that in the end didn't matter. And the same guy obviously went on to win it. And it, I think it's worth talking about Virgil van Dijk. I mean, he's, I mean, what an impressive um, footballer he is, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's calm. He's one of those defenders that never goes to ground. He's quick. He's incredibly brilliant um, in both boxes. In both boxes, he's always a threat, as he proved once again today. He's a magnificent footballer, isn't he? The box that he got in and the, the tackles that he gets in at the right time. And you, you said it, he never looks under pressure. He never looks flustered. He's always sort of calm. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he was he was brilliant again today. What, what's so good about Van Dijk is, do you remember, was it last season, he was coming off the back of a, a really bad injury. And a lot of people yes. were saying that the best days are behind him. And I've had knee injuries. It takes a long time to recover. And he's back into his flow. He admitted by his own standards, they dropped a little bit, but not at the, the level that people were talking about. And it... For a centre half, it's not just your your blocks and your reading of the game. It's how much can you command the people around you. And when he's got youngsters in front of him, and I seen one bit in the game where he's just like growling like a lion, like get back in position, do your job. And I just believe like to have a leader like that behind you is just inspirational. He's certainly one of the the best centre backs the Premier League's ever seen. I think he was brilliant, but I also have to say yeah. behind him, what a performance from Keller. Pulled off. Didn't I he? mean, mag super. Pulled off two he? or three brilliant saves. Even when he was when yeah. the balls were being pinged over the top, he was bright enough and alert enough to to come and clear them. And yeah, he yeah he put in a great performance as well. As did, as did all the Liverpool players. It's funny, I remember it was a couple of years ago, wasn't it, when I think he made one of his first appearances in the FA Cup game and, and he came out and Liverpool spelt his name wrong on the back of his shirt. Can you remember that? Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen again. Yeah, well yeah. done, Liverpool, and congratulations to them. Another trophy, and they're still on course for the, the possible quadruplet. Obviously, it's not the Champions League, it's the Europa League, uh, but they're still in the FA Cup and they're very much in the title race, Honestly, Micah. It's, it's astonishing. It is really because 
You look at the players that they've got out. Jota, Salah, Nunez, Trent, mm. Slaboshla. Could it find them out though? I mean, it's it's a big it's a big ask to keep going like this with with you know so many young players, isn't it, Alan? Yeah, I mean, it depends depends how long the other guys are going to be out. I suppose there was no he couldn't risk uh, Nunez or, or or Salah today in case he puts them out for two or three months, but. Um, he's took the gamble and rested them or maybe he had to rest them we don't know but it, it could do yeah depending on how long they're going to be out yeah the, the kids look good though there's no question about that it's a real talent oh, at, at, at Liverpool what about Chelsea I mean it's a massive blow isn't it I think their first team now to lose six uh, consecutive domestic cup finals um, huge blow and especially I think Really, when you look at the, the way the game went and panned and the, the fact that Liverpool did throw on some really young, inexperienced players and, 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 and even after that, they couldn't find a way to win. Doesn't it typify what, what's happened or happening at Chelsea? This, I don't know how much they spent, 900 whatever mm. million it was. and They just haven't got someone to put the ball in the back of the net. They created the chances. Mm. And we've been seeing it most of the season. Um, They've spent an absolute fortune. Can, and can you imagine? You're in the dressing room. You see the team sheet come through. And today, lads, there's no Jota. There's no Salah. There's no Nunez. There's no Trent. Mm. There's no Alisson. There's no Schlobosli. Mm. And mm. whoever else was injured, you think, this is our opportunity. Mm. And they couldn't. And they failed to take it. And, oh, yeah, we must be heartbreaking for them. It is a little bit heartbreaking. And I'm... I don't want to say I feel sorry for Chelsea. I, I, I don't because football, it's a, you know, it's an elite game and the money that they've spent. But they were so unlucky. We were not unlucky. Like Gallon said, you put your chances away. Look at the one that Gallagher had. He, he mm. just took yeah. took the touch. Maybe didn't take it to one There's nothing side. Nothing unlucky about missing chances, Micah. I, yes, I know. You would say that, Mr. Shearer. <laughs> <laughs> he knows because he missed a few. <laughs> if you look at the overall, if you look at the overall game, and a lo loads of people are going to lump up, lump on on Chelsea now and saying they're a disgrace, they spent so much money and that. And yes, they should have done better against essentially Liverpool's kids. But they actually did create a lot of chances. They created one, one off the post, a one-on-one, -on -one, a doubles. Kelleher was in the form of his life. Some things are just written, and it was written for, for Liverpool today. I thought Gary Neville was quite harsh. Um, but what was it? The billionaire blue bottlers. <laughs> Bottle I mean, jobs. I mean, it's just bottle jobs. Or it was a little bit over. <laughs> it was, over the, it was a great line, but it was a bit yeah. over the top. Yeah. I mean, they could easily have, have won that game. I thought. I thought Cole Palmer was once again the, the standout for, for for Chelsea. I mean, he had obviously that really yeah. good chance, but it was a brilliant save from from Kelleher. It really was. It was outstanding. But you know, I go back to my point. There's nothing lucky about unlucky about missing chances. You create them. Yeah. You've got to put them in the back of the net. And when you spend that much dough on players and you haven't got a top centre forward. You've only got yourself to play. Yeah, indeed. Um, Alan, I know you, you, you're about to get out of your car shortly, but I want a few minutes. Um, we'll just trip back to yesterday's uh, matches. And um, I know you were working with um, Premier League yeah. Productions, weren't you, on the Arsenal and Newcastle yeah. game. You must have been a bit um, a, a bit down in the dumps after that one. I know Ian Wright was showing me, he was sending you horrible messages, <laughs> like, gloating was. like mad, wasn't he? I had, he? His, I had <laughs> his son, Sean, sat next to me and I had right, he texted me, <laughs> It was a bad <laughs> evening uh, for me and, well, more importantly for Newcastle. But I think that's as bad as I've seen under Eddie Howe, particularly in the first half. They were an absolute disgrace in the first half. I mean, they weren't prepared to run around. There was no closing down. They just were off in every single position. Um, they were a little bit better in the second half, but they couldn't cope with Arsenal's intensity. They closed down and it was a rotten performance from Newcastle. Uh, and... They're, they're just so wide open at the minute, conceding so many goals and have done for the last few months. And Why do you think that is, Alan? Why? Well, they're missing the goalkeeper, Nick Nick Pope. There's no doubt about that. He made a, makes a huge difference. They've missed Joe Linton for the protection that he gives them in the uh, in the in the middle of the park. Yeah, yeah they've had. Look, I'm not yeah. I'm not trying to make excuses. They've had so many injuries, and you, I can't defend what went on yesterday because it was it's an unacceptable performance when you go out. And you 
you're not prepared to roll your sleeves up. You go into one of the one of the biggest clubs who are going for the title. You know you're going to suffer at times in terms of possession wise. So when that happens, you got to roll your sleeves up. You got to be prepared to put a tackle in here now and then and close down. And not one single player did that. And when that happens, you deserve to get battered. And they did. And they're going to have to take the criticism that comes that way after a performance like that. Luckily, we're, we're all three of us are at Ewood Park on Tuesday night and they've got the chance to try and put it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super Dan Byrne come on down and got an assist. Alan? Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, he did well. I mean, that was the, I suppose, the one positive to come out of Newcastle was Joe Willock. The goal that he come on, he got 15 or 20 minutes. So that was the one positive of the afternoon. All right, Alan, we're, we'll take a break. Um, and we'll allow you to get your flight home and um, safe travels. And uh, Mike and I will carry on uh, after we take a, a short break. Keep doing the work, boys. That's what you get paid for if you do. <laughs> Uh, well, we're open. We'll get paid one day. <laughs> safe, safe flight, Al. <laughs> Cheers, boys. Welcome back to The Rest is Football. Um, Alan's just arrived at uh, Heathrow Airport, so it's just me and Micah. Quality will be better now, won't it? We haven't really covered um, Arsenal um, properly there. We, la- we allowed Alan, obviously, to talk about his team, Newcastle, but uh, Arsenal were pretty damn impressive. I think it's 25 goals now in their six league games since the turn of the new year, and they've won each and every one of them. They were outstanding, and I say that because the fact that we, we keep having the, the, the question, do they need a striker, and Man City... Mm. 26, 25 goals in six games. It, exactly, doing all right. but it's sort of, they, yeah. they found a formula that seems to be working mm. for them. Um, they've got to go to the Etihad, I think. Um, and, and that is going to be the difference because at this moment in time, um, I, was, I was looking at a lot of Arsenal in the beginning of the season and we was talking about there wasn't getting enough numbers. It was Martinelli, it was Saka. Um, it was Odegaard, but now that's completely changed. It's just whether in them important moments and comparing it to someone like Haaland, even when Haaland doesn't play well, he seems to get a goal or assist or something. It's just whether they can, in the important moments, get it over the line against the Liverpools and Man Cities. But up to now, they've been outstanding. I think what does work in their favour, though, is their their improvement. I think particularly on on set pieces and the real threat that they have. You know, with with people like Gabriel and Saliba coming up, and you know Havertz as well is a threat. They're big. You know, they become like not just a pretty fancy football playing side that are really pleasing on the eye, but they also got the nitty gritty as well. And I think that's I think that makes them into the the genuine title contenders. Yeah, that they I, are. I agree. I was doing the Champions League uh, for CBS, and my analysis was actually their set pieces and the different variations. Mm. So. If you look at their set paces, they they all, or the ones I was looking at, they, they sort of flood the, the first post and leave the back post for a runner, for either Trossard or Gabriel or Saliba coming round the back. Uh, the, the, the wide free kicks have always got something going on there. And it makes a difference because I remember when you go internationals and I think, I can't remember what the per- percentage is but in international football you score more from set pieces than any of your goal so if you've got that in your armory as well as playing yeah. great football it gives you mm. a great chance doesn't it it really does the delivery from both sides is good but Saka I mean it's, it's on the money isn't it oh it's, it's on so the money. good because you've got you got Saka Rice has been taking them as well yep Rice Odegaard has been taking them Zinchenko can take them as well so they've got quality all around but I think Saka's really impressed me the most because when you're a marked man, you you know when you're coming through and, and people don't really know your game, you're a young lad coming through or he's got a bit and he's scoring goals, but when everyone knows you're that good and you're getting two and three men around you but still being able to deliver, I think that's the most impressive thing for me seeing Saka do it mm. consistently now. Yeah, he's, I, I, he's oh. just a gorgeous footballer, isn't he? I mean... His decision making. I know we've we've eulogised many times about Bukayo Saka on, on on this particular podcast, but I think he absolutely deserves it. And he's he, 
he's, he just looks like a young, smiley kind of nice boy. And you, but he's he's strong as well, isn't he? And he's tough and he's competitive. You can see that. I mean, he's he's one of my absolute favourite players. I don't mind admitting it's, that. It's weird now because we we talk about it and we talk about England and all that. And a couple seasons ago, maybe it wasn't a guarantee, but now he's a guarantee on on that right. I mm. think. His all-round oh, yeah. game is just brilliant. And let's not forget the defensive work as well. I mean, he does his defensive mm. work really well, um, works hard for the team, and he always plays with a smile on the face. And that's what makes him so likeable. He's just a, a top player. It was funny the, the week before, isn't it, everyone? We, we were talking with Ian Wright yesterday, weren't we, during, in, in the Match of the Day office? I mean, we have, they're long days. They're long days. We sit there together. We have a lot of talk. We were talking about... Um, the previous week when they got a load of stick for, for celebrating, wasn't it? It was actually a couple of weeks ago when they beat Liverpool, wasn't it? Late on and Arteta was going crazy and and, and Ian was saying, no, oh, that's fine. I love that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like righty. And I wanted to just make the point that I like it when teams celebrate at the end of, of, of games when they've won a match. I, I wish so much, so much it had been like that when I played. When I played... You'd win a big game or whatever game it was. And at the end you go, oh, good game, old chap. You know, shake hands. We well, wouldn't say old chap, but you just shake hands and you walk off and that was it. But now there's, there's, there's a buzz and it involves the crowd. They get involved. They, they, they must feel like that's the connection between the players and the supporters. I don't get the celebration police. Let, let players enjoy it. Let managers enjoy it. Let the fans enjoy it. It's good for the game. It's entertainment business. We're in a, we're in a business of giving pleasure and joy. And anyone that wants to kill joy... It's, I don't know, he's, he's kind of, he's either from the opposition's team, which I do understand because no one likes to see gloating when you lose. But for the neutral, I always think if it were your team, you'd want Agreed. to celebrate. Agreed, what do you because think? you don't get these moments all, all the time. Obviously, Arteta's won the, the FA Cup with, with Arsenal and he, he come up a little bit short and he knows if you beat Liverpool, how big it could be. But I just want to ask you, what, what was it actually like in, in your day? You know, so interviews, how, how was it? Was it more like a radio interview, a TV interview? It wasn't much, Micah. It wasn't Nothing much going at all. on, really. I mean, do you know what you'd do, right? So let's say I'm going, and I'll go to the end of my career, not the beginning of career, because it's so bloody long ago, I can't remember it. But um, but say, for example, at, at, at Tottenham. So say we had a good game at home, you'd win 3-0, which meant I'd probably have bagged a couple, something like that, say. And then they'd, um, you'd and whistle a go, crowd, oh, well played everyone. You walk off, you shake hands with everyone, you go in the tunnel. Um, there'll be no immediate post-match interview unless you were the, a live game, which happened once in a blue moon because you'd only ever get the occasional live game back then. Not now, every game is seen on television. Every match has post-match interviews. That wasn't the case at all. You go in the dressing room and then someone would come in and say, so-and-so, Gary, for example, on the rare occasion it happened, uh, you won the, match of the Man of the Match award. You'd then be part of that might be that you'd do an interview with the radio on like Five Live or not sure it was even called Five Live back then. Um, so you'd do a little interview on the radio um, and, and then you'd go upstairs to the suite where they'd have the Man of the Match award ceremony. But basically it was an excuse for, for the club to get the sponsors to meet one of the players. So actually you didn't really want to win Man of the Match because all you wanted to do was go in the players' lounge uh, and meet your family and chat with the lads and have a quick couple of drinks before before you go home. And so it's I think it's, it's somewhat different um, nowadays. Um, but yeah, that was it. You'd get the occasional Man of the Match award, the occasional post-match interview on TV if you were live which was very rare, and the odd radio interview, um, If you, but maybe one player. The managers weren't interviewed after the end of every game, not at all. Maybe by, they'd have a little, the, the local press guy, or, or the Sundays, there'd be, they might get one player amidst them from the whole match occasionally, but, um, but by and large, it's, it's changed so dramatically. Um, in the last um, 25, and, and just 30 the, Just years. the last one with analysis. Say it was a live game. He said some of the games were live. Yeah. How, how has the analysis changed from Oof. then to, mm. to now? Because sometimes when we talk about analysis and say we talk about 
Pep and he created different positions. And I remember working with Sunes and Sunes used to say, well, hold on, we used to do that back in our day. Was that highlighted in yeah. analysis? It wasn't. No, okay. it wasn't. No, it wasn't. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have the number of cameras. And they're very, very rarely were their live games. You might be occasional one, the FA Cup game, something like that. Hardly any games were on television. It wasn't really dramatically changed until obviously the, the Sky got the rights and the Premier League started. And all of a sudden you were seeing more live games on television. So there was more analysis. Now there was obviously punditry in, in, in my day and before my day. You know, it started probably, I don't know, in the um, maybe the late 70s, um, 80s World Cup, I remember. Um, 86 was certainly punditry, but it was more opinion because they couldn't really construct too much and they'd, they'd show a goal, they might show someone missing a chance, but you wouldn't get that kind of evaluation of different players in different positions or rotation or or a tactical masterclass by a certain team in explaining that. I think that started to change with the Premier League and also started to change. I thought Alan Hansen was primarily the first person um, that came in um, and did things slightly differently. He didn't just like show the goals. I mean, that's where it used to be, show the goals. All of a sudden he was showing... Um, how a team defended in a certain way. And I remember used to say, I, I presented with, with Alan Hansen many times and he used to he used to do an analysis sometimes explaining how a central defensive partnership works. In particular, that was his great strength and understanding the defensive side of the game. And I used to think sometimes I went, God, yeah, actually, I didn't, I didn't know that. And the key to good punditry is giving people at home who are an educated football audience, because we watch a lot of football in this country. The key to good punditry and the best pundits are the ones that show you things that you go, wow, yes, I'd never seen that for myself before. And that that's kind of crept in, I think, post Alan Hansen primarily, and then lots of other players have come in and now lots of ex-players do it and they a lot of them do it very well. Nice. There you go. There's my explanation on, on that. Um, the history of punditry. Manchester City, while we're on the title race, let's just um, wrap up with Manchester City. It probably wasn't their, their greatest performance. In fact, I thought Bournemouth had a real go at them, particularly in the second half and, and might conceivably have got something out of the game. But, um, you know, the, I think the signs are, 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 are ominous for perhaps the others in the title race when, when City win without yeah. playing. Just, just a quick well. line for Bournemouth. Iriola, we, we talked about him hmm. and what we didn't yeah. bring. We've seen certain things earlier on in the season playing high. But I was really impressed with how they set up. In the first half, Man City absolutely dominated. Um, but they didn't give up in the second half and created a lot of chances. But as for Man City, you, you, you know, watching them, and because I watch them more than the most, I watch a lot of their games and... Well, you did your analysis on John Stones. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I mean I his just, performance was unbelievable. Honestly, I, it's just, it was staggering. You know, when we talk about center half, you mentioned Alan Hansen then and how the games evolved, but mm. his heat map or his touch map was all <laughs> over the pitch. And for a player to be able to start in that position, go into midfield, number 10 positions, and then even forward positions, but not get caught out of position is really important, but being able to affect the game in them offensive positions as well. I just think it was, it was one of the best center half hybrid roles I've ever seen, <laughs> I, ever seen. I've not seen a, a center. And, yeah. and people will come back and say, well, this player can do this. But in terms of understanding the system and what Pep wants and, dragging people out of position, creating the space, retaining the ball, looking after the ball in dangerous areas and then making forward runs to create something. I just thought it was a brilliant, brilliant performance. I really did. Absolutely agree with you. Obviously, we've seen central defenders in the past that are really good on, on the ball, lots of those, and some of them breaking into midfield. Obviously, Franz Beckenbauer was was one of the very first to do it. Um, you know, Bobby Moore was capable of that that kind of play. Um, we've seen other players that, that can do it and comfortable. But at times he was like playing up front and then he, he, was, then he was in midfield and then he was, I mean, 
it's just the awareness of when to go. And obviously he's got players that will cover him for him. But what it does, of course, is makes him really difficult to mark for the opposition. And obviously Pep's conjured up this madness and this brilliance in his, in his genius mind. And, and you think, you know, obviously if he goes into a certain position, goes forward, so maybe Kovacic or someone was covering him and this and that and this. But to have the confidence yourself to just go willy-nilly into whatever area of the pitch you want shows not only extreme intelligence, but also kind of courage of your convictions to, to do that. And obviously you have to have the support of your manager, particularly in that role. It will be interesting in the summer. Let's hope he's fit because he would be massively important and huge loss for England if he's not. Um, but whether, you know, if he plays for England, whether England would kind of copy that formula a little bit, I, I don't know. Um, it, would be, it would be quite courageous to do so. But it, the benefits are there. The benefits to see. are definitely there, and it, and I suppose it depends who was to play at right back. If Kyle Walker is fit and and healthy, I think you can allow to do that because of Kyle Walker's recovery place. So when John Stones yeah. sorts of steps into midfield, you've got that balance with Kyle Walker just. Pre- protecting him so that that works then we've talked about Trent Alexander-Arnold coming from right back into that center I don't think it'd work as well you couldn't do both could you no exactly you could I I think it it, it gets a little bit too (laughs) too muddled but also it's not just what stones can do on the ball it's your opposition so you know guys when you're playing against a team and you know how a team plays and they might say, okay, because Akanji's done it in a couple of games, not really worked out. He did it against Chelsea. And you work three, four times a week in training how to stop Man City and what their positives. But when you've got John Stones against Bournemouth, who's basically going into the number 10, and I showed it on my fourth clip on Match of the Day. You did. On, on Saturday night. And it was... Interested to see because because the midfielders didn't want to drop back because they've been given a role to do with the rest of the team. And then the center halves didn't want to step out because they're worried about Haaland and the movement around. So it's how how do you defend that when you've not planned for it? And that's what's so difficult to to sort of stop. And if he's got the confidence to do that for Man City, for England, it could be a secret weapon. It really could. Absolutely. Um, as for Bournemouth, they played my team in midweek in the FA Cup. I'm slightly worried. I think they've, they've been a steadily improving side throughout the season. And um, especially going off, I think if Leicester had beaten Leeds on Friday, um, which they should have done. I mean, they won up and then they absolutely robbed of a goal, a terrible offside decision. And um, and then ended up losing the game. So I stopped smirking because you're up from your Leeds boy. Um, but yeah, but um, I think that would have been a 12 point gap. Now it's only six. I, I, I sense that he might not play his strongest side, um, but we'll, we'll see. I hope he does um, because there are a lot of games, obviously, in the championship. The main thing for Leicester will be getting up, but it's going to be a tough one at Bournemouth. But uh, we shall see. Um, performance of the weekend had to be Fulham, though, didn't uh, it? Well, yeah, right. Right, he was 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 doing that game yesterday, oh, yeah. on Saturday and match of the day, and um, it was just the way they 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 set up. Now it's it's very difficult because Man United have been playing so well. Did they win five in a row before before Saturday before Fulham? Some some something like that. Yes, they were. Hoyland had been scoring loads of goals, and then they started with. Uh, a different, not different formation, but different personnel. Rashford went up front and then Ganacho, who had been playing on one wing, swapped to the other. Then they played the young the young boy, wasn't it? Forson, I believe it was. And yeah. they just didn't have the balance and Fulham really exploited that. It's definitely on the on their counter-attack. I just thought it was a great um performance from them. A will be doing what he needs to do. I think when Adama Traore got introduced, it just gave him a different 
dynamic. I've played with Adama. You never quite know what you're going to get with him, but he's yes. always a threat and dangerous, isn't he? If he's if he's if he's coming on against your team, you're going, oh, oh god. Honestly, guys, <laughs> I, I, he was at Villa when I was there, and and he was a young, oh, right. he was a young guy like? when he was there, and he come from from Barcelona, and he was incredible. He could dribble, he could beat his man, he could drop his shoulder. He just didn't have the end product in terms of picking the right pass. Can I, did you like have a gun shoot? Did you, you know, who had the biggest guns? <laughs> to be fair, I was bigger than him. But he was more ripped. He he had the more ripped physique, and I tried to race him. And it, and is it true that I mean he has he obviously oils himself up. Is it true that he does that so players can't that, that is grab exactly him to slip true. Off? Or does he just like to look good? Do you think? <laughs> I think Michael, a bit of both. But he honestly, I tried both, to yeah. I tried to race him one time, guys. <laughs> and I Oof. I was quick, and I backed myself against. Yeah. Pretty much anyone, maybe not Kyle Walker, mm. Aaron Lennon, Phil Walcott, mm. Gabby Boglo. They was, I think, just, but I backed myself. I tried to race him. He, honestly, it was <laughs> 25 yards. He must have given me 10 yards. His acceleration oh. is ridiculous. If he just gets yeah. that last bit. Yeah, that's just the missing yeah. ingredient, isn't it? Just final that final ball. ball, the final finish sometimes. He's not mm -hmm. quite consistent. Uh, enough. Um, I, I thought I thought uh, Manchester United missed Hoyland, uh, which is a, a good sign for Hoyland, not necessarily for Manchester United. He was injured, of course, uh, and he, he, he unfortunately he denied him the opportunity to join an elite list of players to have scored in seven consecutive Premier League games. I'm glad he's not here because Alan Shearer is one of them. Uh, only three players have ever gone on longer scoring streaks than seven games in Premier League history. Ooh. Can you name them? What is it un, un, under under twenty one or is it any age? No, no, any age. No, any age. Ooh. Any age. Default. Yeah, default. Three players have scored. No. Nope. Leicester title winning season. Jamie Vardy. He holds the record, doesn't he? Eleven games. Oh, remember? Yes. Um, when he did it, I think he's, I think the one he broke the record was against Manchester United, wasn't it? And also, um, um, amidst those goals was that extraordinary volley against yes. Liverpool that came over his shoulder. Remember that? Uh, a good friend of yours is one of them. Ooh, Aguero? You've been working with him quite a bit recently. Oh, recently? Yeah, yeah. Punditry World. Fairly new to it. Oh, Daniel Sturridge. Of course. Daniel Sturridge. Eight, he, he had eight games, and that was um, back in... November to February in 13-14. Um, One more. The guy, um, Vardy beat the record. Manchester United player. Rooney? Rune Dog? R Rue was a good oh, start. Oh, Van Nistelrooy. Of course. Rue Van Nistelrooy. <laughs> ten games, ten games, yeah. Um, at Villa bounced back, your former club. <laughs> Honestly. Villa is, is weird yeah. because... They're fun to they're watch. So, they're so good now, guys. It's ridiculous. Like, you know when you want a team to do well, but it's always more hope, actually, than reality. But the, mm. <laughs> the way uh, Unai Emery has got them playing is just amazing. Uh, the lost ca camera... On injury, the the, the bringing Tielemans, uh, John McGinn drops a little bit deeper. They have got the box in in midfield, leaves a space for for Bailey to do whatever he wants to do. Ramsey, yeah, Bailey was and terrific. Then Watkins is scoring for fun. Hmm. It, it, Douglas Louise is a good player as well. Douglas Louise, Watkins, Bailey have been they were, they were terrific again. Have been much very consistent, I, I think, this season. Um, yeah, so I think um, I think they'll be buoyed by uh, Manchester United's defeat as well as will, of course, um, Tottenham, who don't didn't play this weekend because they were, I think they were due to play maybe Chelsea, um, one of the cup final teams. Um, a good start um, for Glasner, Oliver Glasner, the new Crystal Palace manager. A three 0 win, Sellers part against Burnley, and well, poor old Burnley, another another absolute howler playing out from the back and ended up with a. A red card. You know what, guys? It, 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 it's just it's disheartening. It's you know, Trafford. He made some really good saves within the game. 
He must be playing to instructions. Yeah, of, of course. Monica. But if you're playing to instructions, it's still you have to make the decision. And we showed on match of the day, on Saturday, there was options where he could have played. He waited a little bit too long, got robbed, and then, you know, gets a player sent, sent off. And I just feel like Vincent Company's my mate. I know what he can do. I hope he's okay because it just feels like to take from, from going from being such an elite player and then... And a brilliant job in his starting exactly, management as well at Burnley, taking yes. him up and you thought, um, it's been a bit of a kind of big it's bump. Been a, it's been a it? massive a bump. bump. He brought in a load of new players and lost a few people he had on loan last season. And they've just not hit the heights that we all expected. Certainly I expected. And yeah, it's it, it's not great. But yeah, in terms of Glasner, new Palace manager, it's really yeah. difficult to assess them because Burnley went down to 10 it's men. Too soon, yeah. it's, it's too it's, soon. It's too anyway, soon. It? Um, but obviously yeah. it comes from good pedigree. And yeah, and we spoke about Glasner with Dan, who um the, the big Crystal Palace fan. Um yeah, so it's it's too early, I think, to judge it, but it's a great win for them, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, just to start, you want down to 10 men early and then Bosch uh, three goals. Do you know I bumped into this morning? Who? Roy Hodgson. Ooh. I was out there getting my shopping, getting my Sunday lunch ready, getting my leg of lamb, and I'm 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 driving, just driving back home because it, it, it was raining at that point. No, I was rushing because I had to, I forgot something, that was right. And I, got, and I, I went, Oh my! What? There was Roy, Roy with his with his missus, and um, yeah, and I, I pulled over and said said hi. He looked he looked really well. So that was um, and um, he seemed um, seemed quite happy and relaxed and um, and healthy, which was good. Which was a, a oh, good thing. Oh, good. Is he coming on the pod? Well, I didn't ask him, but I think he would, Roy. It seemed a bit soon to you know, give, him, give him a bit of time. <laughs> let let but, him recover but at we'd, least. We'd, we'd, love to have, we'd love to have Roy on at some point. He's um, such an eloquent and interesting man with so much experience of the game. Of course, um, I should have asked him, but I'll ask him another time. If we go back to today's game, so, um, we're recording this on Sunday evening. So the early kickoff today before the Carabao Cup final saw um, Wolves uh, win at Molyneux against... Um, Sheffield United. It was kind of a, a, a tight game. I thought actually Sheffield United did did better than perhaps they've done in in recent weeks. Um, although they obviously did win at um, Luton. Um, just the um, one goal in that game. Sarabia's t- a terrific header. Um, but you know Wolves are up to eight. <laughs> oh it's just <laughs> we keep saying the same things about Gary O'Neill week in week out. He's just. Yeah. Iriola's worked for Bournemouth and he's worked for Wolves. So it's been... They only had five points after the first six games. It's staggering, isn't it? I think, um, I mean, another one of our producers, John's a big Wolves fan and he seems to be very, very happy. And it just shows you when someone gets a chance, someone's willing to work hard. They've got their plan and they can implement it and everyone buys into it along with good players. You get a little bit of momentum look what could happen. I'm I'm just so happy for him. I, I really am because yeah. I think the stigma against O'Neill, and I know we always talk about O'Neill. We always give the players credit, but I want to look to O'Neill because it was the uncertainty and yeah. what was going to happen. A lot of people said, why does he deserve this job? And people wanted a bigger inverted commas, name, but it just shows you that there is quality here and he's doing and he's doing a brilliant job. Long may it continue. Come on. Yeah, it most certainly is. Um, quite an unusual um, goings on on the pitch, wasn't there, with the two Shepherd United players, Vinicius Souza and Jack Robinson, got into a bit of a, shall we say, a heated argument on the pitch through arms going around a little bit. <laughs> Have you ever have you ever been in, seen had anything like that with you with your team? I've no, I mean obviously I never I could fight anyone. I'd be I'd be too scared. But um, I can't ever remember in a game that I've played him and my t- any teammates of mine have, have had that. I know it happened with Alan, of course, but he's not here because um, didn't it? But um, you but there was one. Well, one there's probably a couple, but there's one that springs to mind. Um, it was when. 
Mancini had, I think he'd been sacked. Brian Kidd was the manager. Oh, take it over for the, the last couple of the games. I think I think it was around that time. And I was playing center half. I think I was captain. We had a game against, I think it was Reading the day, the, the week before. I, I had a stormer. Then I play center half again. Norwich at home. And for some reason, I was just off my game. I don't know if it was because it was, I think it was the last game of the season. <laughs> and Nas, Nasri came like shouting things at me. And me and Nasri are good mates. Like, I love him. I love mm. him to death. But but he what kept he like, y- you know, when people throw their hands up at you. So, so like, I, oh. I, I could have passed forward, but I passed sideways. And he throws the hands up here. And I, I just see that as a, a massive disrespect. So I'm shouting at him. It's it's actually genuinely something that players hate, isn't it? When oh. players start doing that. Because basically it's a gesture for the crowd to know you're giving them sting the, rather than just shout at them when the crowd can't exactly. hear what you're saying. It's just like, oh, even the even he, even he's, even our favourite player, our star yes. player is pissed off with him. Yeah, it's that's that kind ex- of thing, isn't it? Players exactly. don't like that. And it makes, it makes you yeah. feel a little bit, okay, well... Don't, don't, what's, how did I feel at that moment? I felt very disrespectful, mm. but I let it go because he professionally concentrated on the game. Then it happened again. <laughs> so I'm thinking like, should I say something? Like I'm, I'm, I'm captain. So obviously Vincent Company's out or whoever it was. And I thought, no, come on, concentrate on the game. It happened a third time. While the game's going on, me and Nasri are walking head to head to each other. And basically, just as we get in closer, I think someone said, come on, the game or whatever. But we was ready to scrap on the field in front of <laughs> absolutely oh. everyone. Oh. And for some reason, at the last moment, I thought, come on, we're better mm. than that. And afterward, we laughed and joked about it. But in that moment, when the emotion is going on throughout the game and you feel like, it, he, you know what he did? He preyed on the weakness at that moment because I knew I wasn't having a good game and he was showing it to, like you said, the rest of the crowd. I basically took it to heart and I was ready to rumble on the field. Yeah, there have been a few, haven't there? Bowie and Dyer, wasn't it? The, the Newcastle one. And wasn't Graham so? Who was that with? Was that Batty? Oh! Yes, I think it was. Wait, remember I remember that one? Batty with someone. Yes, was it Graham Lasso? Was it? I think. I think it was Graham Lasso. Was definitely with someone. I mean, that didn't memory serves me right. It might have been David Batty. I think so. Anyway, there you got it. No violence on the pitch. Not. Not. Don't fight your own. Don't fight your own. <laughs> I, I, I think. Um, moment of the week. We'll finish. Um, we'll finish this particular episode. Um, with Harry Kane again, who I think just about salvaged any hopes that Bayern Munich have got of winning the title. Um, two terrific finishes, um, um, including the winner in the 91st minute. They had a tough game against RB Leipzig um, at home and they won 2-1 and and he, they were brilliant finishes. And, uh, you know, whatever happens to Bayern <laughs> this season, um, if, even if they don't win anything at all, it will not be his fault. It won't, I know we had a little bit of tongue and cheek with with Spurs and yeah. whatnot. He is, in terms of all round player, he he is the best number nine in the world, isn't he? You know, in terms of all his attributes, he he is. Haaland, yeah, I prefer because he's just right place, right time, goal getter. I would rather have Haaland, but all round game where he can drop into number 10, play the passes, link up and all that stuff. Yeah, of uh, uh, Kane, definitely. Uh, you know, I think sometimes people underestimate the, 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 the his mental strength and his, his power to put, you know. I mean, obviously it's a tricky period for Bayern Munich. They lost three games in a week. Tuchel's been, he's, he's, he's lost his job or he's going to lose his job apparently at the end of the season, which is a peculiar one. Um, and then he he just soldiers on and, and does what he does and, and and he's such a brilliant finisher. He's one of those players we were talking about. I was talking with Wrighty. We were watching the Bayern Munich game yesterday, weren't we? Had it on, and and he 
we were talking about someone missed a one-on-one -on -one in one match that we were watching. Then we were saying, you know, with some players, you know when they go through, they're not going to, or you don't fancy them to score. And then other players that are going through one-on-one -on -one with a keeper, or they have a, like a decent chance, you just know, you know that 99 times out of 100, they're going to finish that. And Harry Kane is most definitely one of those. And left foot, left foot as well. It <laughs> strikes left both, both left just, footers, both clean finishes. He's so two footed, yeah, though. Isn't it, he? It, it, it's sad. It's sad to see a player like that not have. I, don't, I know he'll be a great, and I know we had this conversation before, but he, sh he should have a couple of Champions Leagues, couple of Premier Leagues, couple. Of, you know what? If he wins the Euros or a World Cup, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, that will do. That'll do. That'll do. That'll that, do. And let. Let's hope he does. Let's hope he leads England to 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 glory and gets the, the you know the most important trophy of all, a, a major one with his mm -hmm. with your own country. That would be fabulous. And on those um, aspirations and that optimism, we'll finish um, this particular episode of the Rest Is Football. We'll be back with you on Wednesday as usual with our question and answer episode. Uh, we'll see you then. Goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Have a great week, everyone. Mm -hmm.